Hello, Brad here. Just to say we're super proud that the Friday 5pm podcast is sponsored by the Malt Miller, the UK's best home brew store. We use the Malt Miller for all of our homebrew experiments, as well as tapping them up for advice and binging on their awesome YouTube channel all the time. That's why whenever we release a homebrew video, we put a recipe kit live on the Malt Miller, so you can brew with the exact same amazing ingredients that we did. The same ingredients used by pro brewers. So alongside the Malt Miller's nitro flushed hops, cold stored yeast and milled to order malts, you can pick up recipe kits for our Five Points Best Bitter, Russian River West Coast IPA and now the fastest beer in the world, a hazy session IPA that goes from grain to glass in less than 48 hours. Sign up to their newsletter at tinyurl.com forward slash Malt Miller to get 5% off your first order. With the Malt Miller's amazing customer service and Johnny's 48 hour recipe, You could order the ingredients on a Monday and be drinking the beer by the weekend. Speaking of which, it's Friday. It's 5pm. So enjoy this week's Friday 5pm podcast. It's Christmas! I think we've now started about six videos like that on the Craft Beer channel (laughs) and probably at least three podcasts. But I'm into it. It never, ever gets old. It's fucking Christmas. It's the time of year. Yes, worlds are colliding in today's show with music and beer coming together in the perfect blend. Um, Should have said harmony. Come on, Rob. Oh, okay, yeah, that would have been much better. Damn it, Johnny. That's definitely <laughs> a fun thing, guy. Um, yeah, it's a really, this is a really fun episode um, with two of my good friends. You may notice in the Northern Irish twangs. Um, so they're from the MFP podcast, which is a really good podcast about the music industry. Um, presented by Greg Houston, um, a very long-standing friend of mine, and Mr. Kevin Baird, another long friend of mine, um, who makes up one third of indie pop outfit Two Door Cinema Club. Um, so these guys are perfect for talking about about music because they know a lot about it. Yeah, they both both work with musicians and indeed are like. I mean, I love Two Door Cinema Club. When you when you said yeah, I know Kev, I was like, oh my god, um, they were. When were they their biggest? Like 2010, 2011? Tourist history came out in 2010, um, but maybe actually a bit earlier, um, 2019, yeah. And they exploded sort of under the indie scene with like quite electro sounding indie pop, I suppose. They're, they're really, really catchy. So their music, if you don't know the band, you'll know the music because they're in a lot of adverts and things like that because... Yeah, really catchy, good, fun band. And if you ever get the chance to see them live, they're definitely worth checking out. Yeah, fingers crossed for 2021. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we got those guys on to talk about our favourite Christmas singles and indeed what what constitutes a Christmas single, which I don't think we really get to the bottom of, but we do get some amazing recommendations. Like, this is not a podcast where we're just going to talk about the classics. I mean, I was going to, but these guys... Uh, came out with some some really unusual uh, and really excellent music, Christmas music that I've now listened to that I hadn't to hadn't done before. Didn't know Bob Dylan had a Christmas single. Yeah, that was the revelation of the podcast for me. Yeah, very much so. Um, yes, Greg is a bit of a indie Cindy, and I he didn't disappoint with his <laughs> his alternative. <laughs> Christmas have you have you had time to listen to my recommendation, the Tellison song? I haven't, but, um, well, we can talk about it after, but I have put together the playlist, which I fully intend to listen to the rest of the day as I work. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and we're going to put a link to the playlist that includes every song that we talk about, whether we talk about it as our favourites or just they they get referenced in the conversation so that you guys can listen to that after the show as well. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to delay any further because we do ramble on for well over an hour about all of this. So let's get stuck in uh, with Greg and Kev of the MFT podcast. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a happy. Happy New Year! 
So welcome, Kevin and Greg, to the second annual Christmas Bubble podcast. Oh. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So nice to be here. So nice to have two massive beer enthusiasts on the podcast. Oh, yes. Is that right? They both looked shocked when you said that. I mean, Greg, Greg does love big stouts and Kev... Well, actually, I, I've written a little intro because... So Greg and Kev are in a podcast called the MFT Podcast, which is why we got them on, because they're music buffs, and that is the sort of reasoning behind this episode. Um, and they do very good intros each week on each other, and I did write a good intro for both of them, but deleted it, but I will try and ad-lib an intro for both now, so all the lovely listeners know who we're, sp- we're speaking to today. So first up, we have the lovely Greg Houston. Um, Greg is owner of Baby Sweet Sessions, um, a very successful video production company that specializes in music videos. He has worked with the likes of Tito Jackson, um, Circa Waves, Van Morrison, and the one and only Tudor Cinema Club. He, when he's not recording music documentaries, has worked on documentaries on badminton and Mr. Gay Universe. Well, that's very true. Greg has a penchant for stouts um, and loved beer so much that at the tender age of 15 borrowed his father's ID to try and get into a pub <laughs> unsuccessfully. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. That is very true. And then second up we have Mr. Kevin Baird. Hello. Um, one third of indie pop trio Tudor Cinema Club, formerly of Hair Rock North Down Band at Life Without <laughs> Rory. <laughs> um, when Kev's not slapping the bass in his uh, wife beaters, he has a punch on for shit laggers, he told me before. Although I do believe, I may have made this up, that you used to ask for local craft beers on your rider. Is that correct? Uh, used to, and then you realise that the craft beer um, scene isn't quite as good in some places as others. Um, to put it politely, um, I'll, oh, there is just a, a real, real uh, theme emerged when playing festivals in the UK where you'd say, oh, some craft beers and they go, OK, that means an IPA. So they'd go to the supermarket and get something from like Green King or something that was just IPA and it was just horrendous. Um, so then we all realized that we all like just shit lager. Um, so we just put that back on the list. <laughs> Sometimes it's nice to keep it yeah. simple, just crisp and crisp and get the slime out of the throat, you know? What's your shit lager of choice, guy? Um, shit lager of choice. Um, I mean, I do quite enjoy when you go to a pub and they have multiple laggers on tap. It feels it feels really rare. That's how you know you're in a good place, I think. <laughs> um, so I quite <laughs> like San Miguel. I think it's quite nice. Yeah. Ooh, Continental. Um, yeah, yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm feeling high bra, I might, I might take a Asahi or something. Your brother's favourite shit lager is a Holston Pills. I do love a Holston Pills. I actually was it a Baird family trait? Felt quite like I would I had I had become, reached a certain age and I got rid of this bar that I had in my house and when I went behind it just I hadn't used it in so long. I found uh, bottles of Holston pills back there that me and Patty must have been must have been saving for a special occasion. The, the one of these things about craft laggers just the sorry to interrupt. The first time I got drunk was on a shit lager and it was Dutch Gold. And it was twenty three p a can, and that is uh, that is the truth. It was twenty three p a can, right? And uh, my mate bought a crate of this beer, and I had about three, and was kind of out of it. And uh, but where do you draw the line? You're talking about getting the craft laggers in, because in my local shop, I've bought the Northern Monk beers, which I love. But some of these cans are maybe eight pounds, or something, you know, or there was one that was like six pounds seventy nine. And it was like a, a pineapple or something. What's the pina colada lager sort of thing? Or IPA, whatever it is. Beer for children, if you ask me. 
Kevin, it was the nicest beer I ever had in my life. <laughs> yeah. But the problem was it was 6.79. So I, I always went in there and I thought, am I going to buy one of them or am I going to buy three that I don't like as much? You're going to get three. You know, where is I the thought you were going to do the maths for how um, many 23p cans of lager you could get for 6.79. And that would have been most of the rest of the <laughs> podcast probably. <laughs> yeah, it could have been. But uh, yeah, what what's the better value? I d- well, I don't know. Depends what your end goal is, to have a good time or to get pissed, I guess. If you want to have a good time and get pissed, the ultimate tip is you head down to either, oh, Aldi or Lidl. I can't remember which one. And they've got cans of a beer called Rheinbacker. It's 70p a can. And it's basically Krombacher rebranded. So it's a great German Pilsner and it's 70p a can. And yeah, so a four pack is £2.80. And that, that's when budget is tight for me. That's where I go. Wow, that's a real good beer hack. That's a result. Actually, we buy wine. Um, I'm not sure this is the right place to say this or not, but we would get wine from Aldi. That's oh. where we do our shop, and it's actually very good. Their Pinot Noir <laughs> is very good. What has this podcast it, oh, become? A nice Coupe de Rue. <laughs> I'm did, sorry, Jonathan. I did sorry. read a, uh, you know, the, comp- the testing company, Witch. I read, a, a, yes. they did a review on Aldi's... Uh, Brute Champagne won best sh- sh- Christmas champagne this year. It beat Vouve and it beat uh, you Moet. See, people need the ex- in the taste people test. need to accept the facts. It was yeah. a blind test, a blind witch taste test. That's a that's yeah. a witch best buy right there. I, this I like this the podcast is sponsored Kev by witches. Not tour at the moment, so he sits at home. He's become a bit of a Karen. And he's reading which uh, best buy to see what the li- like life hacks he can have. Yeah, well, one of my of questions, money. opening questions, was going to be, you know, Kevin, how has this been year, this year been given given COVID and given what you do? <laughs> and clearly, it's it's been slow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, t- you know, uh, money isn't so tight that um, yeah, worrying too much about um, my Aldi champagne. Um, but you are reading yet, but <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm reading which all the time. It's great, you know. I don't want to get you just you just feel like a complete dickhead when you you buy something and then you go on to witch afterwards and it's like do not buy this this is a rip uh, it's an awful feeling and it, yeah it's like having that you know older person like a parent or something where you, you know ask their advice before you do anything and it's just a website <laughs> um but no things are good um obviously a bit of a, a bad time for for a lot of industries you know beer included but music as well um Hopefully, there's some 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 uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, yeah, of course, you know, a little few positives that come along with some more time away and, you know, being at home more, more time to, like, work on music and, you know, spend time with family and, well, maybe not uh, really spending a lot of time with other people. But, um, yeah, nice to be back at home for a good bit. But, yeah, it's not it's not really ideal for... for if you're musicians on the whole, to be honest. You did do one of those shows, though, didn't you? You did one of the first. Yep. In the UK. Uh, yep. Yep. The f- the I think it was technically, hmm, is it the world's first socially distanced arena? Um, one of those stats that's made to sound, you know, incredible. But you know, socially distanced arenas. <laughs> I mean, There's never been any demand for it before, so it's not a big deal <laughs> being the first. <laughs> Well, we were supposed to be the first concert and then bloody what's his face played. They booked him the day before, last minute. Can't even think of his name now. Sam Fender. That's Kevin, the one. Local hero. He's on the list. <laughs> so he the dartboard too. behind me. So you don't even How have that claim to fame? Well, it's do- he's doing all right. So me. it must have been all to do with the first socially distanced arena concert. And in this time as well, you have launched a podcast which i alluded to at the beginning the mft which well you tell us what's what's that all about well um mft stands for my first tour and it's basically a podcast where myself sam another guy in the band and the lovely greg who you also have on here uh we chat about you know some of our experiences from playing on the road and experiences of touring and hopefully a bit of light-hearted fun and proud to say uh, it did come out over the pandemic era but the pandemic isn't mentioned a single time so 
Um, Respect. That was kind of... But taking shits is mentioned in every episode. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Right, let, let's get the seasonal feels back. Um, so this podcast is supposed to be all about our favourite Christmas singles. Last year, we, we fell out pretty spectacularly over the classic argument, the classic 90s argument of whether Die Hard is a Christmas film. Uh, this this year, I hope we have lots of passionate views about whether East 17 stay brackets another day is indeed a Christmas song. Jonathan, well, I'll let you carry on, but <laughs> I'm going to go in early here and say it's not it's not a Christmas song. But let's crack that was on. a real Kanye. I'm going to let you finish, but I'm going to talk over you just for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan. Um, but yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll get to stay. Uh, but it would be great to hear what your guys, uh, your favourite Christmas singles are, and then the the other three of us can can shoot you down. Uh, should we start with Greg? You know what, Jonathan? I really wanted to put um, good research into this, you know. And I was saying to you before, I've just been so bloody tired that I haven't put as much in as I want. But I've got songs. There, there, there's, you know, there's so many great Christmas tracks out there, you know. <laughs> And uh, they're they're always all the classics, but I'm going through. I've actually got. I'm not going to take the piss. I'll be quick with these, but I've got three songs that I think are worthy mm-hmm. of mention. Well, last year Brad brought <laughs> seven <laughs> Christmas films to the table, so wow. three is actually a trend yeah. down. So yeah, go mad, go mad. Right, first things first. Kind of, I guess. Uh, where do you start in these? Right, I'm going through a big Bob Dylan phase at the minute. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've I just I I given myself the target at the start of this year to read four books, and I had I've failed. Uh, I was failing really badly, and uh, I picked up a big Bob Dylan bi- uh, biography, and so I've been a big Dylan phase. And he he's got a Christmas record out uh, that he released. Actually, it's, you know what? He, I think he released it about ten years ago, but it feels new. And he's got a song, Must Be Santa, and he's in the music video, and he has big, long, straight hair. And people laugh at it, but actually, I think it's a classic. I think it's a classic, and it's great to, to see uh, um, one of the icons getting back into Bobby the Christmas Dylan. record. I, yeah. I, about Christmas I had time. no idea yeah. Bob Dylan had a Christmas song. If, if you ask me whether Bob Dylan celebrated Christmas, I'd probably say no. You know, it, you know what, John? It's an album. He's got yeah, a Christmas no. album. Surely that's him cashing in in the sort of quieter <laughs> years. I mean, well, they're not all. They're not even all covered. I don't know. It's very good. I'd call it. It's called uh, "Must Be Santa." Is is my first one. I'd recommend anyone to check that out. Just if they want something a bit different, mm-hmm. right? But then my wife basically is the person who she started listening to. I think it's called like an indie Christmas and it's all these um, Christmas songs that I would never think about and there was one by Phoenix have you heard that? No. There, Phoenix have an amazing one and Bill Murray does the intro have you, Kevin have you Actually, heard that? That was a Netflix thing Yeah they did a Netflix about three years movie. ago Was it a year ago or two years ago? Well that I was listening to that this playlist and it came on it's called Alone on Christmas Day and it's an absolute banger Really? It really is. I think it's a classic. I would say it's the modern um, Paul. Mac- What's the Paul McCartney one? Simply I having a Christmas wonderful time. Christmas time. Yeah, this is like the modern one, except it's about being alone on Christmas Day. But it's kind of there's really been a upbeat. definite move in recent times towards sad Christmas songs. I think you know Band Aid started it, but why <laughs> why are, why are we seeing? Do we feel the need to drag Christmas down these days? We're like. We can't be too happy. The world's gone to shit. So I'm going to sing a song about being alone. Christmas is just a miserable time of year. Okay, let's go into that. <laughs> it is, you know, so much pressure, so much build up, and ultimately, yeah, ultimately a big letdown at the end of it. I would say, um, yeah, just a m- real miserable time of year. Oh, Kevin, come on. <laughs> I'm only you're, joking, you're yeah. I'm only have, messing. You're about to have a baby. You're about to have a baby born on Christmas Day. Yeah, it'll be all about his birthday. Christmas can go can go do one. <laughs> when did you turn on Christmas, Kev? When did I turn on Christmas, Kev? Yeah. Um No, like tur- like dislike Christmas. Oh when I when did I turn on? I thought you meant like, like when 
the Christmas version of me? When did I hit the? Oh, I want to ask that question yeah, afterwards yeah, as well. Yeah. I think that's a great question. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what, yeah. So, when um, was it you decided Christmas wasn't for you? I don't know. Just was it a bad gift? A bit, uh, when you, once, well, once you get a bit older and you're a bit like, you know, you're not really excited about. I feel like Christmas was ruined for me from a young age. I can vividly remember being the. I have two older brothers who Rob and Greg know both well and. Yeah, I can remember my older brother Johnny telling me that Santa wasn't real, and I was I was three. So like, I went the whole way through primary school oh, not believing oh, in Santa, yeah. and I can vividly remember my mum telling me, um, not to t- I wasn't allowed to tell anyone in my class. I found out really early as well. I think I was five because I remember it was in it was January, and from Santa I'd got a really nice woolly hat, and I came out onto the playground where my parents picked me up. Uh, and like another parent said, oh, that's a lovely hat, Johnny. Where where did you get that from? And before I could answer with Father Christmas, my mum went like JD Sports. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what? <Let's see. laughs> JD Sports? I'm actually, 16? I don't, well, I don't know what the JD Sports was in, in 1992. Probably Woolworths. Guys... That's just horrible. I, you know, I'm sorry. Like, Johnny, your brother went in early there, Kevin. And then your yeah. mum is... Shattered the illusion for the. I remember on my street, um, I lived had wonderful neighbours growing up, but I remember playing football with them, and the one house was older, and they said to me, um, "You still believe in Santa Claus?" And they laughed about it. No, you, I no, like, I don't. no, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. And I can, I swear to you, I can vividly remember leaving after I said, "No, I don't. No, I don't." And going, Santa, I do, I do still believe in you. <laughs> As I as I <laughs> ran back up my driveway into my that, house, that's a brutal way to find you know? out. You have to do the mental gymnastics, working out that it's not, and then reacting as if you always knew it, and then having the realization later. That is brutal. Yeah, <sighs> it's hard. What a wonderful Christmas podcast! Tell us your favorite, uh, your last favorite song, Greg. <laughs> Sorry, my last one. You know what? And I, I do have a classic here. I've got a classic, but the other one I want to give a shout out to is Julian Casablancas has one, and he, it's called um, I Wish It Was Christmas Today. It's on the same, it's on the same indie Christmas podcast, and it's just fantastic, Jonathan. I think he is one of the, he is one of my favorite singers of all time. I just really love his voice, and but on this one, it's not one of these sad ones. Like, he's properly going for it. And he's probably shouting like, "I wish it was Christmas today." And it's actually a bit of a rocker, huh. and uh, I just, I just love it. I think he's the coolest guy, and I think it's just uh, for me that's going to be on my Christmas play- playlist for, for the rest of my life. Probably, I just love him. I'm, 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 I'm absolutely delighted because I have not listened to any of those three songs, and I thought we'd all have the same ones. Well, I'm not I ha- disappointed that Greg came in with lots of indie bangers. Yes, yeah. it's, it's good. <coughs> I have, I do have my my favorite one, but I, I don't want to dominate the start of all this chat about songs. The the favorite of the big ones, which is the obvious one for me, I think. I have some facts about it, but maybe we should go into that later. I don't know. Let's if it's the one I'm thinking of, we'll we'll come back to it and do some facts. Sure um, thing, Kevin. Uh, are yours as idiosyncratic and awesome as Greg's? Um, mine certainly don't. Uh tip their hat to the indie gods quite like Greg's do. <laughs> um I I feel like I don't know if I'd call it my favorite, but interestingly, I don't know if you'll be able to guess, this song was banned uh by the Catholic Church. Uh wow. apparently maybe just in Boston, but maybe beyond for, for in 1952 for bringing sex into Christmas. Wow. Oh, S- hang on. Santa uh, baby? I, no. 1952, it, Johnny? I think I... Is it going to be that one, I saw Mama kissing Santa it Claus? It is. I saw Mommy ah. kissing Santa Claus. <laughs> Actually, uh, the, the m- most Christmas? famous version was a Jackson 5 version. Your mate, Greg. Not Michael. It's Tito time. <laughs> Tito. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I always... I, yeah, I can, like, played in, like, orchestras at, at school... And, you know, when it came to Christmas, you had to play Christmas tunes. And so you'd always play all the Christmas tunes. And I always loved that the melody of I Saw Mummy Kissing Santa Claus. But I like, didn't know the you words the trumpet, because only ever you played it as an orchestra. No one sang it. So then sort of hurt hearing it 
later and then you sort of think about it a little bit and you and i and today went back and read the lyrics and it is just mental it's just some weird like santa cuckold fantasy sort of thing <laughs> it's absolutely bonkers um you know it's like then i saw mummy tickle santa claus underneath his beard so snowy white oh what a laugh it would have been if daddy had only seen mummy kissing santa claus last night that's oh, wow well, and it was banned in 1952 uh, the original version by jimmy boyd um, apparently was banned by the Catholic Church in Boston on the grounds that it mixed sex with Christmas in 1952, well, apparently. Well, whoever singing that doesn't res- think much of their father if he thinks he's going to be laughing about his <laughs> wife yeah. having an affair, is he? He knows the marriage is over, yeah. you know? <laughs> he's like, there's an easy divorce. Yeah, he's been <laughs> crushed down, he's broken, actually. This is tragic. Where's the song about the dad, you know? Then it makes you think, like, oh, is it the kid seeing uh you know what he thinks is like a fantasy sort of moment but it's just the guy from the local santa's grotto he's seen dressed up as santa you know and then there's a real dark <laughs> undertone to it that he maybe is really witnessing an affair um and it's like oh no that was just santa you know um i i, I i'd kind of assume that that song is the dad dressed up as santa i yeah i think that's probably Ooh. what it is um, you would hope. Maybe I'm just naive I and love that, you know, still believe in the idea of love. Yeah, I love that. That's very wholesome. I love that. But it that. would still be quite a thing f- for you as a child to s- still believing in Santa. I know Johnny and Greg, or I Kev, didn't believe in Santa from a very early age, <laughs> but for you, Greg, age 12, seeing mm-hmm. your mother snogging a white bearded man. Listen, on a on a... I remember on my sixth birthday, I was a very my, a very lucky boy growing up. And on my sixth birthday, my parents got uh, a guy to come to the house dressed as Bugs Bunny, you know. <laughs> and I was like, this is absolutely <laughs> immense. This is incredible, you know. My mum spoiled me rotten and we had a wee puppet show and there's this guy dressed as Bugs Bunny there. And I remember someone gave me a birthday gift and I ran upstairs to put it in my room. And Bugs was sitting on my bed with his head off having a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that didn't end with your mum was snogging Bugs Bunny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> it's wild. Huh, revelations from start to, to finish. <laughs> yeah, that was going to... Yeah, I saw Mummy bed. Kissing Santa Claus was my sort of obvious Christmas one. But then I feel like, you know, growing up, the cool kids all loved that uh, Sufjan Stevens album of him doing Christmas carols, which is it is all pretty great. Discs. Yeah. Oh, I remember seeing that in somebody's house and uh, kind of just being like, that is the coolest thing. You know, the artwork was so yeah. good. It's like, how'd you get this? What it is this? It came with like a cool poster and it was like a, a setting with him around the, cri- like really Americana and uh, hi- him around the Christmas tree with a family and it loads of stickers and stuff in it as well. I got bought it for Christmas. Yeah, Circa well, 2005, I'd say. No, I'm maybe later. I'm going to say Hannah got, my wife got me into that as well. She kind of has turned me on in a, to a lot of uh, <laughs> she was like, it's it's a I've slip. I've got to behave myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was 2006, he, Rob. 2006, yeah, yeah. Songs for Christmas. Yeah, it's good. Oh my God, it was f- it was a five disc. Five disc, yeah, yeah. And it came with loads of other stuff as well, like it was sticker pack, the poster, cards, all sorts of stuff. It's one of the things we don't talk about, you know, with the digital music revolution. You you miss that feeling when you get a proper double album, mm-hmm. you know, and you get a poster in the in the centerfold. It's like floppy disks when you try and load a game when we were kids, and it's like fourteen floppy disks, and then you get to play Monkey Island. Like there's a an additional yeah, physical joy. I totally. You know what? Even even going to I could talk about computer games for a long time, Jonathan. We're not. But even, <laughs> like, the old Super Nintendo games, you know, if you bought Mario or something, it would come with an instruction booklet that was so, inc- like, it was like a Bible, you know? But now if you buy the PlayStation games, uh, you don't get an instruction booklet. It's all, uh, it just doesn't happen anymore. Grand Theft Auto gives you a map, but That's the r- map's yes. also in the game. So 
I've yep. never used that map, but it was it was nice to open the box and go, ah, oh, it's a waste of trees. Then throw it in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I do live in a house with a fire mm. in Zone 1 London, first floor. Um, <laughs> uh, Rob, um, are, are you going to rescue me? Because I'm hastily crossing out my favourite songs and putting significantly more indie tunes down. No, I, I went pretty traditional. Um, I did expect Greg to go very indie, so I thought I would keep it keep it a bit more mainstream. That's your um, story. So first of all, I'd like to say my least favourite Christmas song is the Band-Aid one, and that's mm. mainly for Bono and him <laughs> saying there won't be snow in Africa this Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it just really winds me up. It's oh in the Southern gee, Hemisphere, yeah. I think it's summer. So yeah. of course there's not going to be snow. Yeah. Um, and I just hate everything about it, so not a fan. Especially the charity angle, <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose they are from the mainstream angle slightly alternative so honourable mentions Paul McCartney Christmas time um, big Paul McCartney fan and uh, he's just he's just great and that's a very very good song um, Pretenders 2000 Miles oh is that Christmas is it that's whoa. officially it's a Christmas song whoa 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 you say officially who what offici- Who who's the officiator of what a Christmas song is and isn't uh, Santa right what makes uh, that Christmas? Was it a Christmas number one, or does he sing about Christmas in it? It's Chrissy Hines, is it? so it's who? Pretenders or no? Or, um, I'm gonna fact check this. I think it's, it needs fact it's, checking. It's, Chris, it's Chrissy Hines sings it. <laughs> and Chrissy Hines. So we're not talking sing. about we're not talking about the Proclaimers version. Yeah, you talk about the Proclaimers. No, the Proclaim- no. Just a second. I don't even know Chrissy Hines Weird that we all Just assumed it was Proclaimers Even though you said They're Pretenders (laughs) Yeah we just Yeah (laughs) just glossed over it 2000 Miles Chrissy Hines Check it out Not the And I would walk Oh that's 10 That's 500 500 miles That's 500 Is that not 5000 5000 500 500 And I would walk 5 And I Fair enough Not very far really In the end I mean I think calling it that where, where are the proclaimers from? Are they Scotland. It's from Scotland. If you walk 5,000 miles in any direction from Scotland, I think you're in the sea. So, <laughs> unless they were going to walk in a circle, then they couldn't really the go sea. a lot further. Get in the sea. <laughs> right, so it is the pretenders and not the proclaimers, but... Rob, we'll, we'll I, you know what? I laughed, and I take it back. Thank you, Greg. Um, the next... Honourable mention goes to Little Drummer Boy by Bowie and Bing Crosby. Yeah, the the video for it is so funny it's and spectacular. weird. Spectacular, yeah. Like, I think it was released around the time Bowie was eating peppers and just doing loads of drugs, like <laughs> high in his addiction, just after the Berlin trilogy. And the thought of him calling around for Bing Crosby and having that <laughs> weird forced conversation is brilliant. I- I, I believe because I've watched, you know, at Christmas we've all got time on our hands, like Kevin does every time he decides to log on to Witch. Um, and I remember watching a TV show about you know, the, the the making of the great Christmas songs. And I believe Bing Crosby had no idea who David Bowie was. Like he he was just told that. like you sit there, and you know David Bowie's coming in, and I guess they assumed he'd know. And he was just like, uh, okay, um, who's this guy? And you can kind of see they're not even really looking at each other. They just there's a zero chemistry. I love that though, Jonathan. It's like uh, just that weird mix. They don't do it. It's not like that nowadays. That you know that couldn't happen. But like he probably thought, who is this young kid? Mm-hmm. And probably thought uh, he's a sh- you know a shite singer. <laughs> yeah, I mean David. Bo- I mean he, he was a genius in many ways, but his vocals were probably not the strongest especially after all the drugs that he was probably doing at that point and I, he's probably just amazed to be vertical by the end of the recording session he does a great bit about talking about how normal his christmas is and his son he's only six years old and how it's just a normal day around the christmas tree with his old dad david eating <laughs> a pepper um anyway so my favorite christmas song is, qu- is quite an alternative one it's uh the waitress Christmas rapping, um, which is kind of like an 80s hit. And it kind of sounds like the B-52s or Talking Heads or something. Uh, do you know which song it is? I have never, I've never do heard do of do this. 
That is a banger. That is a banger. Yeah, I've never um, known who that's by or anything. A song that everyone knows and no one knows yeah. who yeah. it's by. And actually, when I was listening to it and sort of writing notes on it today, I was trying to think who it sounded like. And the B-52s was the first thing. And then when I looked them up on Wikipedia, one of them went on to be in the B-52s. So there's a there's a there top go. fact for you. Hmm. Well, and I, I think I like that song because it's a Christmas song, but it doesn't necessarily sound like one, and you could listen to it all year round despite the content. It's I'm also impressed. like you know the chorus is always what makes a Christmas song, right? It's got to be something that you can hum uh, and just that sticks with you for longer than it should. Whereas that chorus is like it's weirdly offbeat and like staccato. It's like Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, like, I can't really yeah, yeah, yeah. tell you how it goes, but if it comes on, I'm like, Bang. it's got a great melody, and the the her little sort of rhythmic sections and the lyrics are great. So check it out. Fine choice. Is it Christmas rapping with a W or just an R? With a W. See, it's a pun there, Kev. Oh, okay. Be smart. Seriously. Okay. That You're so good modern, pun, Kevin. You're it? so modern, always thinking of modern things. <laughs> I think the opening line in it is New "Bah name. humbug." <laughs> Love so, yeah. Kev, you'd like it? I would. <laughs> right, Johnny, you're in the hot seat next. What is the Christmas song of choice? Oh, God. Uh, so, I mean, my favourite Christmas song of all time is Driving Home for Christmas by Chris Rea. Oh, I love that one, Jonathan. Um... I, I I love the story of it. In, I always think that British musicians have never been good enough about singing about the places they're from and the places they go. Like in America, you know, there's all this all this country and alt rock about you know people screaming Mississippi and Georgia. Uh, why Georgia? Why Midnight Train to Georgia? You know, the UK version is Chris Rea, a semi-successful guitarist and singer, singing about a drive to Middlesbrough. Um, is that where he's it, going? That's where he's going. He's oh, going back wonderful. to Middlesbrough. Yeah, um, I remember it, it was in a Calor Gas advert. I think that's yeah, it's very Northern Irish. Is that a, is Calor Gas NI? Is it? Maybe you're right. I just thought it, I always assumed it was a very Northern Irish ad. It's very mm. ITV. It was. I mean, mark, mark. There's lots of markers that it's a classic Christmas for, uh, single. There's that. It was an. It was in an Iceland advert, and it was also covered by Stacey Solomon. So. Wow, you know. <laughs> those are I'll the makings of a classic. To to go back to mine, I, I I looked at the cover versions and the Spice Girls covered it. The waitresses. I didn't really? listen to it, but I'll check it out later wow. and I'll let you know how it is. You know <laughs> what? But big shout out to Stacey Solomon. Go on, um, I'm listening. I did a job out in. Uh, she's from Dagenham, isn't she? I think she came out, I think she's from Dagenham, and I did a job in Dagenham, and I just thought, (laughs) when I was in Dagenham, I was like, Stacey Solomon's from here, and sometimes when I'm walking around uh, Boots, um, I remember seeing Stacey Solomon perfume, and there was like a discounted price on it, and I thought, she's had a go, fair play to her. (laughs) I, I, can I? Can I? Uh, I need to ask um, the panel if it's allowed to be a Christmas song, because um, it's it's hard to know what is and is it allowed to be considered. But uh, a few years ago, this is going to sound like a brag, but it's a bit of a it's a it's a good story. So bear with me. Um, a few years ago, at uh, at the uh, the the peak of hype about two door cinema club so about 10 years ago um <laughs> on our first album um we got uh, we got um an advert we got a debenhams advert for one of our songs called this is the life and um yeah when you do an advert like that they basically say all right yeah we'd love to use your track for six months and then they said like a little stipulation if they want to continue to use it afterwards then they have to give you more money basically but you don't get a choice in the matter and at the end of the six months it was the christmas period and they took our song and they just put jingle bells on it <laughs> like just Whoa. sleigh bells over the they top added of it, it on, they added and it then on? used it yeah they added it on and apparently it was in the contract they could do it they could make they could make <laughs> creative the edits Claus. to the song 
of the contract. Wow. Yes, and we was mad. Come on. Yeah. What the yeah. damn? It was. It was. We were kind of a bit like taken aback, and it was horrible because it was on like it, on like every screen on the advert when you went into the department store. So it was just everywhere. Um, and your song with uh, sleigh bells over the top. Have you been more, <laughs> more uh, Does that count as a Christmas uh, contract now? No, yeah, no, no, yeah. It's lucky that no one's asking us. Otherwise, <laughs> we'd be really strict with the contract. <laughs> Have you ever considered writing a Christmas song? Uh, no. I think I think it's one of those things where Christmas songs cannot, new ones can't be done really that the the hit ratio like the percentage that must get written and then not mm. make it is um probably you're not really got very good odds i think blossoms have a new christmas i think song. that's on the same um, playlist like, i think that's in the indie playlist but you know what i was going to just say about yeah. the new ones i just just in defense of the new ones because i feel like they just don't like some of the older songs you might not even like, but they've they've become part of the institution, and I think the new ones just need a chance to do that. And I think mm. actually, I'm, I'm not saying I'm into this song, but I think it's like, I think the darkness have one. I was just I about to say that. that yeah, that, oh, I yeah. think that's kind of crossed the barrier a bit, right? Well, I think a big part of Christmas do you think show it's just time? songs, as yeah. Kev said, it's like nostalgia. Mm-hmm. So y- it reminds you of the time of year. So it's very hard to release the song on on year one. It's giving you that feeling. So it takes a bit of time to bed in. Mm-hmm. But I think that Darkness song was released in like 2007. And it was Don't Let the Bells End. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. a classic pun. I would say a bell end was a popular phrase to call someone <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. does so time stamp it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I'm glad that I'm sure they're very happy, Greg. That now you, you feel nostalgic when you well, hear I Christmas time. Don't let the bell end. I'm not saying I'm into the song. I just feel like it. They've done the. They've fair play to them. You know that they, they have cracked it. And but like say that that Phoenix track or whatever is there is no reason why that should not be a um I th- played on radio played on radio one or whatever it is that it takes to get these things I think, to I think what you need is like a decent enough first year that it will, like Rob says, like remind people of a certain time. Because if you look at the history of Christmas singles and their success, loads of the ones that we consider seminal now were not big in their first year or were not the biggest. Like even where I carry all I want for Christmas was number two. I it think it got number to number one, one yeah. this week for the first time. It did. Time. Yeah, I heard it that. It did. Topical. In 26 years or something. But uh, Christmas songs are like are like football songs. You know the songs that y- they, they make when like uh, whatever team is going to the World mm-hmm. Cup? They're so naff at the time, but then... A bit of physical distance you know, and something afterwards. the lightning seeds can be cool. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but that, but I feel like that, 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 that lightning seeds, not to go down to football songs, Rick, but that lightning seeds song <laughs> is is special it is and actually it was quite big at the time i think mm-hmm. yeah I yeah think yeah they I'm were being unfair to that st- track yeah they were singing in the stands but you said something jonathan there about number twos and this is one of these facts i had read about um you know an all time the fairy tale of new york you know which is you know ha- you know hands down one of the greats no doubt um that wasn't number one mm-hmm but and do you, uh, do you know what kept that off number one any of you? I don't. Uh, when it was released, even. Yeah, whenever it was first. I'm not talking about um, well, no, what, what the year? re-releases. I think that it was re- originally Mind released deep. around no eighty seven or eighty nine. I think. So I'm not talking about any of the reissues because the things are can be number one now quite easily. I think. But back in the day, this was kept off number one by the Pet Shop Boys and a cover their cover of Always on My Mind. Ah. And I remember, I love, um, I love the fairy tale in New York, and I remember being really pissed off when I discovered that. And um, <laughs> but then I saw the Killers headlining Glastonbury, and um, they brought out the Pet Shop Boys as a special guest, and they did a cover of Always on My Mind, and I was having it. I thought this is, <laughs> I am fucking having this. You're in. And yeah, I am. And I just thought, you know what? Again, I don't mean to keep saying this expression, but I said fair play to the Pet Shop Boys. 
were having it and then whenever i was bathing my son we started to put the pet that song on always on my mind and west end is it west end boys west or west end boys, boys? yeah yeah and i just really went through a phase it's a strange bar like like west end boys sure always on your mind <laughs> while bathing <laughs> Jonathan, I am all that is always on my mind is just absolute top drawer song, and someone's just done a line of coke and put a dance beat on it and sang it. <laughs> and they were big all pioneers <laughs> of the auto tune sound as yeah, well, which is now being used to death. But they they did it first. So I am I am happy. I I don't know. There's just something about it. It's so lazy and it's a monster hit. Yeah. And there's something I quite like about that. But one more thing on Friday Hill in New York. If I bef- I don't want to dominate these things but how much do you think Shane McGowan would make a year sorry I say Shane McGowan the Pogues what do you think the royalties in that are Kevin you're, you've are you got the inside track what would your prediction be well what I was going to say is I bet you you don't have the right answer <laughs> um, <laughs> because oh, what what well what I what I was what I and what I'm basing this on was I saw something on BBC Breakfast the other day and they were talking about that Mariah Carey song and just a quip at the end of the segment was Mariah Carey has earned forty million pounds in royalties from the track and it just I I, th- I feel like I spat out my tea and just said that is bullshit. How do you know? No one knows. Like you couldn't go online and say figure out how many how much royalties I've made off a track or I could how, how does anyone know is just people guess and is that and the bullshit. overall sum people would guess but then there's obviously a lot of splits well yeah there's no you know you don't know how much Mariah Carey herself owns mm-hmm. of the track does like a, rec- a record company own the master does she own it Kevin, this you is- know does she get 50% of it of the royalties does she get 80% you know there's another guy, there's a quite a lot of drama with another guy who allegedly wrote the song with her and now Mariah Carey claims that she wrote it when she was like six years old. It's because she heard board. on BBC Breakfast um, that she should have earned 40 mil for it and she's suddenly like, no, I wrote that. Where's the rest of my money? I would argue 40 million sounds very low considering it's been a smash hit for about 30 years. Oh, but, okay, would that, well, that, that, that's, that's that my professional be per, opinion. per year though? No, surely no. not. They they didn't specify. They just said she's earned forty million pounds from the track, and then left that as if that was a fact I've on got the a news. Good, um, um, Mariah Carey fact. For so yourself. sorry. Go on, Greg. So with that, that like... awesome build up, tell us how wrong your figure is. Well, my my wrong figure is that it's reported that the Pogues make this is uh, was an American thing, by the way. So. 509 $509,000 a year the Pogues but the Pogues yeah, I could bring see in that. oh you're seeing that Kevin are you I uh, yeah I'd actually maybe say that's oh, quite low there we go I would have thought that's quite low it's played a lot I uh, I saw the Pogues live about four or five years ago um they every Christmas, obviously not this Christmas, they do a tour where they they do a Pogues tour and they always play play the Fairy Tale in New York. Um, and Shane McGarren is is I don't I, I hopefully this isn't a surprise to anyone. He's not a well man, um, <laughs> and he could only do he could do two or three songs, stood up, and then his wife would come out. He'd get in the wheelchair, she'd wheel him off, That's and he'd sad. be gone for two or three songs. And then he'd come back again, uh, and his birthday is just before Christmas. No, um, Jonathan, his birthday's Christmas Day. Oh, it is Christmas Day, is it? it so is, they yeah. they brought him out a cake, at the gig, and uh, put some candles on it for him to blow out. And I I swear to God, he had no idea what was happening. He was like, "Why? Why is there some fire in my face?" I think I've seen a video of this. And does he? No, he's not able. No, to blow he, them out. he didn't really have the air in his lungs to do it. That's sad. Oh, it's man. sad. Also, do you know uh, the who the, f- the 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 lady who sings Kirsty McCall that song? Killed in, McCall, uh, killed in a jet ski accident. Killed in a jet ski accident has a f- has a has a nephew in an indie band. Go well, on, they, go on. I am in Two Door Cinema Club. 
Um, close. Are we guessing? Uh, her. Uh, hey? I thought you wanted us to guess. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, yeah, I can go, just tell just you. Tell us. Uh, her her nephew is Jamie McCall, g- uh, guitarist in Bombay Bicycle wow. Club. Wow, well, that I is never. a good one. Johnny's favorite band, I believe. I, yeah. I do love that band. I think So Long mm-hmm. See You Tomorrow is an amazing album. That's wicked, isn't it? Huh. I love that. Mm-hmm. You know what? And just on family, f- on family connections. Just this is completely not connected to Christmas, but random. <laughs> In this Bob Dylan <laughs> book I was reading, everyone can feel. Now th- again, I'm just going with it. This is what it says in this book, okay? Everyone can feel sorry. How can Bob Dylan's kids live up to that, or how can people live up to the, you know, Paul McCartney's kids live up to him? As far as I know, as far as I know, the highest selling studio album, not best off in the Dylan family, highest selling studio album actually belongs to Jacob and not Bob Dylan. And they his band he had a band called The Wallflowers and I think they outsold any Bob Is that yep, his son? Jacob the Dylan and they won a Grammy oh, wow. for that album. And um so I this think is why you get the music. Is Tom Petty in the Wallflowers? Did I no, make that's that? the Heartbreakers. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did something the else. The Travelling Wilburys was Petty in them. Oh yeah, I'm thinking of the Travelling Wilburys. That's with George yeah. Harrison, isn't it? My Mariah Carey there fact is that she's got the most expensive engagement ring in the world. Wow! Because of all those streams, Kev. Again, how 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 do you how do people quantify these things? Bring it down to Hatton and Garden. No, I, I've also it. seen Mariah Carey live. Where? Uh, <laughs> my brother used to work for the BBC, and he got me into Top of the Pops, and I saw Mariah Carey, Mario, with "You Should Let Me Love You," and he sang it to a mirror with his back to the audience, um, <laughs> and wow. then Basement Jacks. Oh my gosh. That's a good song. Yeah. And then the next week, I, I mean, I was about 16 at the time. The next week, they had Green Day and Foo Fighters. So I was livid at my brother. That was quite cool. You were in the <laughs> audience for Top of the Pops. Yeah, there, there is footage of Fern Cotton saying something and there's skinny me with long hair and a goatee going. Oh. Sorry, people can't see that at home, but they can <laughs> hear it. Have you ever played it, Kev? Or was it done by the... And um, No, it was kind of done by the time... But famously, Top of the Pops is all mimed. Yeah, because Kurt Cobain played his guitar uh, backwards. Uh, your it was it was almost exclusively mimed. Yeah, yeah. He did something. He did. So I, there was footage of the the Beatles played Top of the Pops, but the BBC deleted the footage, so there isn't actually any footage of the Beatles playing Top of the Pops, except somebody found a film reel in their shed. Oh my god! And they had filmed their TV. They had filmed the Beatles on TV wow. on a film reel back in the day, and that's all there is of the Beatles on top of the Pops. I need to look that up. There is, just for folks at home, there's an amazing interview, the Adam Buxton podcast with Paul McCartney just came out like a couple of weeks ago. It is the most amazing thing. It's like talking about it, going, like speaking to his, his, uh, his family-in-law, and they're like, what did you do today? Just the idea of asking Paul McCartney, who's now you know an old man, what he did today, and he's just been in the studio writing more seminal music. But it's a charming interview. He's the most normal seventy-year-old man. Grace. Um, so uh, I haven't even said my. So I had three Christmas songs as well. Um, the second one is a, a little. I describe it as a ditty, written oh. by one of my favourite emo emo band. I went through a strong emo phase. There's a band called Tellison from Kingston, London. Uh, and they wrote a song called Don't Tell the Truth This Christmas, um, which is one of these very sad songs. It's about if, if if you want to break up with somebody, don't do it at Christmas, do it in January. Um, okay. And it's beautiful and heartbreaking. But then, uh, talk, it's a new Christmas song, and we, we joked about it before we started recording, and you guys kind of were surprisingly open to it. But Sa- Santa Tell Me by Ariana Grande... It's been my earworm for the last month. Yeah. We're not judging. Great voice. Great great voice. The song, the, the chorus is great, but when the chorus starts repeating itself and the choir comes in at the end, as all Christmas songs have to have, it's just remarkably uplifting. It, it, uh, it, 
it does it for you. I, I, don't, I don't think I've I don't think I've heard it, Jonathan. <laughs> I hate that no, I haven't heard your Bob Dylan one, but you haven't heard my Ariana <laughs> Grande <laughs> one. It wouldn't have made yeah. it onto your indie playlist. No, I don't think, <laughs> I don't I think I Greg. But um, you know, good honor. I love to get the modern ones on there. That that's good. So that will be on your playlist from now on, Jonathan. Yeah. It's it's been on my playlist. It's been on for a couple of years. It's a bit of a sleeper hit for me. Like my my oh. wife has played it multiple times, and I've been like meh. And some somehow this year, maybe the sta- nostalgia's kicked in. How old is it? Uh, twenty fourteen for Santa Tell Me. See, it's um, the nostalgia thing. It's had time to develop. Yeah, and, now it and it, again, you it was it. not a big hit when it first came out. It was charting at like sixty or seventy, but in most countries in the world. Um, and now the only place where it's been number one has actually been number one in the US Holiday 100 billboard um, and also in South Korea but that's it that's the only number ones it's had I'm going to check that out I will I will give it a go it's 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 a it's a juicy little banger like the homebrew I'm drinking right now you should Ooh. check that out along with the pretenders and not the proclaimers <laughs> Greg <laughs> yeah no, I will. just remember how many miles it is folks I will check these all out actually all these ones I haven't heard. So that, we've got quite one. a good mix of young and old songs, some very alternative songs. Well, that's good though, isn't it? It's like, um, uh, you know, it's like a good Christmas dinner, right? It takes a lot of ingredients, Jonathan. I'm so into this. Carry on. Well, that, that was it. That was the short version there. It takes, oh. a, lot <laughs> 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 yeah, t- it takes a lot of ingredients to make the right, to cook the right dinner. I think let's... Let's cater for everybody this Christmas. This year's been like an isolating year. People have been alone a lot. So why about we just cater for a group of people this year? Mm-hmm. And we've got it with this playlist. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. There was there was something you said beforehand, um, just about what what like is that E seventeen song a Christmas song? Yeah. And what what's your verdict on that? Because I I but I don't know I don't think we were recording, but I was quite like no, I don't think it is. Christmas well, song, let's you know, let's use that is, question. I, I wanted to finish this podcast. We're, we're fifty-three minutes has absolutely flown by, but I wanted to finish this podcast by asking you guys what you actually think a Christmas song should have, and we can use "Stay" as the as the model for that. Is "Stay" a Christmas song? And if not, what does a Christmas song have to have? Uh, that goes to uh, contestant number Greg, please. You know what? I'm gonna just put. I think a Christmas song needs to have the word Christmas in it. <laughs> no, I do. I know that's, sure. a, that's a, it's a simple thing, but I do. I think for me, that is, you know, that's paramount for me. I would just classify it like that. So we put in stipulants for Christmas movies last year after the Die Hard debate, which is, I do think that is a Christmas movie, but Brad, who was on Christmas, the podcast, had sure. mentioned that it needed to have christmas trees in it and that has an abundance of christmas trees it just happens to be about killing russians mm-hmm. so i think that's <laughs> fine and christmas songs do they have to have christmas in it i'm not sure that's just my that's just my criteria so uh, can we correct i think it's germans it's yeah, germans hans, hans gruber yeah it's not a cold war kevin they're all, the <laughs> 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 they're all the same oh goodness <laughs> Um, right. So, so for Greg, it has to say Christmas, but Rob, <laughs> Rob disagrees. But Rob's a racist. So, um, what? A- anything else that needs to be in there, Greg? No, Jonathan. Honestly, I think that's it. I think if Christmas is in there, um, then I think it, it, it. I would give it a listen. And I that's where that Stay falls down. Yeah, uh, arguably, yeah. Arguably, but there was snow in the video, Greg. There's snow in the video. Yeah. Um, there, but. It's um, I don't know. There's just something about. It. There's so many number. There's an Oasis song. I think it is uh, whatever, that w- they tried to get the Christmas number one. Um, it was released in that, and that isn't a Christmas song, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was kept off number one by that song Vienna. Oh, Ultravox. That nobody knows the verse to. <laughs> it's one of those songs, isn't it? Yeah, um, but so that isn't a Christmas song, that Oasis song. But yet it could have been Christmas number one, and uh, Stay for me isn't. So I've got a counter argument for you then, Greg, because uh, when I mentioned Little Drummer Boy, you nodded in agreement. 
there is not one mention of the word Christmas. I've got the lyrics up here. Not one. So is that not a Christmas song? What is he singing about? Pumpa pum pums. The nutcracker, isn't it? Something to do with the nutcracker. He does talk about gifts. So if you if you can talk about gifts, Christmas, maybe trees, or Santa. Yeah, listen. Uh, I'm open to this. I'm not close-minded to this. Is what's good. It's it's all about debate. But if he, I I guess a counter argument, Greg. Is there any songs that are not a Christmas song? That mention Christmas? That came into my head, and I think there is. But I, I, I can't back that up. I can't back that up. And I'm going to try... I can't no, think of No, not any. on the spot. But I, I think there is a song where Christmas is mentioned that I, I do like. But I, that's useless. Ke- Kevin, uh, it, it, can, can it be a Christmas song without the word Christmas? Well... It's hard to quantify Christmas. Chris is all, Christmas is all about cheer and spirit, isn't it? Uh, except so in your house, apparently. There's something in the in the in the magic sort of fairy dust and of Santa's sprinkle over the top, um, something like that. I don't know that or like sleigh bells seem to be on every mm-hmm. Christmas song. Sle- um, some sort of bell. Hello, sorry. The kind of argument is tubular bells is all bells. Very on Christmassy. Not Christmas song. Very exorcist vibes, yeah. Yeah, this um, tubular bells isn't a Christmas song. No. Jonathan, um, did you say, do you believe E17 is a Christmas song? I, controversially, because I do believe Die Hard is a Christmas film, I don't believe that Stay is a Christmas song. All right. It does have quite a Christmassy video, though, does it not? Yeah, but I, I think I think, for me... What makes a Christmas song is that it has to be aimed at the Christmas period. So Die Hard is a Christmas film because it happens at a Christmas party. Uh, and so it's clearly marketed, even though it didn't even come out at Christmas. It's about a Christmas party that, you know, goes about as wrong as a Christmas party could, particularly for Hans Gruber. Um, and so I, I, I think the intention of the original artist is important. Whereas I think that Stay Another Day... I don't think the intention was to make that a Christmas number one. I think the intention was to release um, a, a hit single and it, it happened to be ready at Christmas. Well, if you think about, you know, every single one of those, like, you know, reality TV shows, like your pop idols, your X Factors, they were all geared towards ending at a time where the winner would release the hit single and then that would be Christmas mm-hmm. number one. Because that is the time of year where, um, you know, it's the highest sales point for record companies. So that's why they always did that. So you'd have a load, a load of, if you looked at every Christmas number one and songs that come out around that time, a lot of them aren't actually, you know, Christmas songs, even that's though they are. very good yeah, floor in my argument, Kevin. That is skewed the facts. I do agree with that uh, big time. Although it does, Cause it now does if raise... You look, oh, sorry, Rob. You, if you look at that period of time, like... 2000 to 2012 they probably had like 8 to 10 Christmas number ones and most of those artists are not around anymore Leona Lewis yeah, well she no. kind of spared she was on BBC Breakfast the other day They've got them all. About yeah. how much money Mariah Carey made <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we now go live to Leona Lewis like, how? How <laughs> in Dagenham <laughs> um, Jewel McKeldry <laughs> Oh, God, yeah, that's a name out of the archives, isn't it? Yeah, he was kept off number one, I think, by either... Who Obama was it kept? Rage Against the Machine. St- Rage, Rage Against, Against the Machine. machine. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say Rage Against the Machine. That was going to be my next question. Very Does, recently. Would my theory make... Um, was it Killing in the Name, I think? Uh, would that make Killing yeah, in the Name yeah. a Christmas song? Because it was in... I mean, it wasn't originally released for it, I guess, but no, it did I make No, I think you one. can't include reissues, definitely, I don't think. Because it's so skewed now, isn't it? What? <laughs> just silence. I'm appreciating just, uh, this monumental uh, conclusion. I'm just glad that we don't have like a Captain Tom number one this year. Ooh, don't think I can like deal with any more yeah. of that. Who walked around the garden? The fucking yeah. toys cashing in on an old man, literally raising money because the toys <laughs> yeah. wouldn't give it to people that needed it. 
Was that number one last year? I thought that was yeah. a COVID Hang on, thing. I didn't even realise he released the song. <laughs> that is a COVID thing. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. I'm shocked that he. You know what? He sh- he sh- he isn't Christmas yeah. number one. He should release one. a cover of 500 Miles. Or 2000, <laughs> depending on which band you're talking I, about. He did, I think he did a song with someone else, though, like Michael Ball or something, didn't he? Uh, no, Ball is doing something with someone else. They, they, I think they call themselves oh. the biggest boy band in the UK because they had their second number one. Michael Ball and someone else. Wow. There you, there you go. go. Right, so I've got a final question to round this off. Uh, what, what do we want to see at, at Christmas number one? Whether they're a contender or not, what would we love to see? After this year, we've had... What what should be number one? Captain Tom. <laughs> Captain Tom. It's hard, um, isn't it? Because nowadays anything can be it, right? Because if, if something's streamed enough, isn't isn't that right? That's all taken into account, mm-hmm. and YouTube play. So that's where the majority of so the chart comes from. Yeah. You know what? Literally, then I'm gonna go for just off the top of my head. I'm going for. Always on my mind by the Pet Shop Boys, <laughs> uh, num- number one for the second time. Let's all let's all go out with a bloody banger this year and keep Shane McGowan off the top spot. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I I I mean the the song that I want to see at number one is Last uh, Last Christmas by Wham because they've never been number one either. It's it is a wonderful song. Uh, it, it it captures the sort of camper side of Christmas, which I really like. And it's still it's still mm. got a, a a feel good at least uh, music even if the the lyrics are are kind of really sad. Um, what I hope isn't is if you if you've heard Robbie Williams's tilt for Christmas number one. No, um, I haven't. The the first two lines I'm not going to get this exactly right because I watched it once and then wanted to throw my laptop out the window. But the first two lines are something like it's been a terrible year. Some of our friends disappeared. Ooh. Okay. Mm. Ooh, that's not a good rhyme. In many <laughs> ways, yeah. really. Every every angle it's wrong. You know what? I, I Yeah, I wouldn't... I'm in a good mood, I think, because Rob gave me a very strong stout just before this happened. That'll but do honestly, it. there's other times where I would be dead against them. But you know what? This year... If Robbie wants it, I would say all right. I would. Um, <laughs> Winnie, my son, was really into the tiger who came to tea, and uh, we watched mm. that. And then at the end, Williams actually sings the theme, the song that ends, th- that's in the program. And I, I read a story, and he was saying that he grew up. And it, was it the Snowman, or it was, it was some song he watched growing up, and so he always thought he wanted to be in a big kids show. Now, a good friend of mine took the more cynical approach and he's like well why doesn't he give a, an unknown the opportunity to be in this big show rather than taking it for himself and I totally get that um, but you know what today I'm just feeling like if if Robbie wants it let him have it <laughs> go on Robbie <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't think we'd end a, a Christmas singles podcast by championing Robbie Williams for number one, but there we go. You know, Christmas, Christmas miracle. Do you think we can start like a campaign like they did with Rage Against the Machine, and uh, <laughs> the bubble brings Robbie Williams to number one? I, I don't want to be seen to be championing a, po- uh, a single that rhymes basically death. Uh, as the fir- the second line of a Christmas single. I think, I mean, we don't decide what a Christmas single is, really, in the podcast, but we certainly, I think, can't say that a Christmas single should talk about the death of loved ones in a pandemic. 
Yes, I mean that's that's fair enough, but I still don't think it needs to contain the word Christmas to be a Christmas song. I'm, I'm so torn on that. I think it's got to have Christmas phraseology. You know, Santa, <laughs> Christmas, no. I think I think that's saying it, it has to be Christmas is a bit much. I love that. I have to have Christmas <laughs> phraseology, and if it doesn't, you're not a Christmas song. Quite right. Um, Simon Coyle never achieved a real Christmas number one. No, Very I stand cool. by that. I'd also like to point out, when I got home, I did more research the Proclaimers and the Pretenders are two very different bands. <laughs> 500 Miles and 2000 Miles are two very different songs. Um, I mean, listen to both. They're both good. Um, one is obviously very patriotic for the Scots, um, and the other is just a great Christmas song, which I don't know yeah. if it means the word Christmas, Johnny, so maybe you wouldn't count it, but I definitely do. Uh, it, no, they talk about Christmas in 2000 Miles. Must be Christmas time. Is that Chrissy? Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> I've got Chrissy next to me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, a lot of really good good tunes talked about there. Um, Greg's indie bangers. I actually listened to Greg's indie playlist when I got home, and there's a lot of good songs on there from like Phoebe Bridges and Phoenix, as we discussed. Um, some really quite obscure ones, a lot of suffragian ones. Um Andrew Bird, Fleet Foxes, the Eels. The Eels have actually got a really good one, which I did know, called Christmas is Going to the Dogs. So oh my god, yes. True Mr. E fashion. It's it's pretty pretty bleak. Um there's there's also uh, another one I forgot which is a band called The Long Winters. Uh, and they have a song called Christmas With You Is The Best, which is like an anti-Christmas song. So Kev might have appreciated it. Yeah. Um, and it's it sort of the lyrics are like, we'll have no turkey or guests, sleep in late. Uh, and then there's something like, and before we get up, I'm going to give you a present. And he says it in a very sexy way. It's a, a weird but refreshing Christmas song. <laughs> And we have a huh. playlist, which Johnny has linked in the description. Um, and it would be great if you could all go on and listen to it in full and then tell us what you think the best song is. Who's the winner? Um, oh, I'm my God. I'm very confident with my choice of the waitresses. I listened to it when I got home again. And I was like, it's so good. It's proper, like, talking heads sort of style, 80s, yeah. Aleppo alternative pop. It's brilliant. It's one I, I always forget every year, and then usually you're in a shop and you hear it and you remember how good it is. It's great. I think maybe what I'll do is we'll, we'll put the Spotify link out and then I'll do a poll. Um, we can do polls on YouTube and on Twitter. I'm not sure. I don't think we can put a poll with that many options, but I'll select... Our four main ones. We all sort of had a definitive answer, I think. Yeah, I think we did. So I'll put those four up. Uh, and we, we can have a proper poll and, and see what happens. So I'll put that live. That'll be live by the time this podcast is. So please do listen to the playlist and uh, vote in that poll, wherever you choose to do it. Um, all that's left really is to say a huge, huge thank you to everybody that's been listening to The Bubble uh, this year, and specifically The Bubble episodes. Uh, the Bubble as a whole is now a top 50 food and drink podcast, uh, even though this time we haven't talked about food or drink. Um and uh, we've had about 60,000 plays this year, which has just been absolutely amazing to see, given the, the humble beginnings and how young the podcast is. So huge thanks to everybody that's been listening to these. Th- huge thanks to those that support us via Patreon. Uh, and and huge thanks for uh, all the, the comments and the questions we get into both podcasts. They're, they're always uh, received with great glee. Yes, it's been a... Uh... A challenging year, as people like to call it, but it's not not been easy to sort of make contact uh, podcasts because part of the fun of doing this is meeting up with people and sort of having a beer with them, and it is different over um, a Zoom call. But we sort of managed our, our way around it as best we could, and we've managed to release some really strong episodes as well. Some of our favorites, including yesterday's one, or sorry, <laughs> today's one, today's one. Yeah, you're still on it. Um... Yeah, I think um, I, th- I think we've 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 had a decent year, but it's going to be great to get back out there and, and meet people and um, you know really get get sort of vibe with people rather than talking at a screen, which 
I'm sure everybody knows at this point is is soul sucking. So yeah, we're gonna have a big year. We've got some great plans for the podcast as well. Um, some great guests lined up. So it's gonna be a good year for the bubble, and hopefully a good year or a better year for everyone in 2021. So have an amazing Christmas. This is our last bit of content from the Craft Beer Channel. Rob, you have the honour. I'm going to give you the last word from the Craft Beer Channel of 2020. What's it going to be? It's got to be stay safe, stay in your bubble, and enjoy the bubble. Yeah, you fucked it. The Bubble Podcast is brought to you by the nerds behind YouTube's Craft Beer Channel. Head to youtube.com slash the craft beer channel to watch this week's video and over 400 more exciting episodes. If you love what we do, please, please, please do subscribe and even join our Patreon at patreon.com slash craft beer channel. Love and beer. <laughs>